Our speaker today is Dr. Joseph Schumann, who has been the leader of the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen, uh, Bergen County for 43 years. That's right, 43 years. And is currently, in addition to that, part-time leader at the New York Society for Ethical Culture uh, with Ann Clayson, who you saw last week, and our own Richard Corll, who you'll see, I'm sure, at some time when he gets a free moment. Anyway, uh, Joe, in addition to those things, is also a professor. And he is professor of, of human rights at both Columbia University and at Hunter College. And for many years, Joe has supported the, the sanctuary movement, um, both as an organizer and also as a host to a, uh, a family of refugees. And uh, he has uh, supported uh, efforts to uh, block the death penalty, uh, efforts for gun control. And also he writes, he writes quite a lot. And in addition to his own writings, he's been a, a force for organizing writers to help support them and get them uh, to be joining together in collaborative opportunities, such as the most recent Ethical Culture Journal. Quick show of hands, how many people have been reading the Ethical Culture Journal? Uh-huh, uh-huh, come on folks. Okay, so all you need to do to find this journal is go to aeu.org. That's aeu.org to the resources page, and then there's, uh, we've actually got three editions so far, and there are more coming down the pike. Um, but uh, good stuff. So the way the journal works, Joe will pose a question, and then a number of people will respond to that question. And so there are interesting takes on, on things. So check it out. I think you'll, uh, you'll find it enjoyable. Um, Joe is also just a longtime colleague, and we are just coming fresh from the uh, National Leaders Conference uh, where we rode down together, and so we had a good chance to visit. Um, and he's really been a long-time dedicated person for the ethical movement. So he's here today to talk about the farther reaches of humanism. So please welcome Joe to the podium. Okay, uh, it's great to be back at the Westchester Society. I haven't been here for too long. I used to come almost on an annual basis, but it's actually been so long that many of you I really don't think I know, which is very good, and there wasn't a municipality outside your window last time I was here, so <laughs> that just shows how long it's been since, uh, since I've made this, uh, this journey. Um, I should say, um, yeah, Bart was very kind to me in his introduction, so let me return that favor. I think we're all very fortunate, and I'm personally very admiring, that Bart is the executive director, all too part-time, of the American Ethical Union. And uh, if truth be told, for a good number of decades, the, our national or federated organization was pretty much in the doldrums. And what Bart has been able to do, and I credit him primarily with it, is turn the ocean liner around in shallow water. Uh, the American Ethical Union now has been burgeoning with a new program. Uh, it's uh, become uh, a source for uh, a vital public voice on national issues. Its board of trustees has become far more serious and more solid. And I think as a result, he has raised the spirits of all people in the ethical movement who are concerned about our federated organization, have really raised the spirits about our national organization, which reciprocally, I think, really raises spirits pe with people locally and is all to the good. So um, I wish personally that uh, Bart's position were not merely part-time, but could really expand to a full-time position because he has been an extraordinary asset uh, for the ethical culture movement, and what I would say is let it continue. So there you are. Thank you, Bart, for all you do. Yes, I wanted to talk about, uh, get back to basics this morning, and talk about our underlying philosophy. So this talk will be a bit philosophical and a bit historical, and maybe, if I'm lucky, even a little bit inspirational. But uh, let, me, let me begin as follows. Um, I held my first human rights class of the new semester at Hunter College, where I've taught since 2003. Held the first class in late August. It's an advanced class comprised mostly of juniors and seniors at Hunter. The class is more than three hours long. And at the second class, during a break in the middle, I was approached by one of the students who had a request. In totally unaccented English, she asked me if she could leave the class a bit early in order to attend a meeting on campus of DACA students, of which she is one. 
I asked her about her situation, and she explained that she was brought to the United States for, by her parents from Guatemala when she was eight years old. She's an altogether pleasant young woman who, despite her circumstances, seemed upbeat and hopeful, but I could not resist the thought that her disposition masked what must have been an underlying fear and sense of dread and uncertainty. Things may not turn out well for her. At the end of the day, she could very well be seized, put on a plane, and sent to a country she barely knows better than I do. Her hopes and dreams for the future and her investment in college totally upended and destroyed. I must admit that I see teaching at both Hunter and Columbia University and being able to educate my students as a privilege and a sacred trust. I also confess that I feel protective of my students, recognizing that they could readily be my own children, or more recently in recent decades, my grandchildren. My immediate, my immediate unspoken feeling was one of compassion for this delightful young woman, coupled with a desire to want to help. But that emotion was immediately followed by a sense of helplessness, recognizing that in a foreseeable future there is nothing I can do, no intervention that I can undertake, that would rescue her from what might be a very sorrowful outcome. It was a brief human encounter that brought it with it for me a very strong emotional resonance. Well, I begin with this simple anecdote as being emblematic of what I understand human, humanism to be in its wider embrace. My encounter with this winsome young woman was a brief one, but for me it was a humanistic moment. Hopefully what I'm trying to convey will become clearer as my presentation unfolds, but first I have to put it into some context. As we all know, we are living at a very coarse moment in American history. It's an unsettling moment and a dangerous moment. In less than a year, it feels as if we have been ripped from our moorings. Those values and assumptions that we have taken for granted as fixed and have endowed us with a sense of security suddenly have been upended and we are left insecure and perhaps bewildered and frightened as well as outraged and angry. It feels as if we've gone down the rabbit hole and have suddenly been transported into an Alice in Wonderland universe where the fixed points that define our reality have been kicked away or stood on their heads. The chronic promotion of lies as if they were truths the heralding of, quote, alternative facts and behaving as if evidence, even if it stares you in the face and it makes no difference. All this is the most radical assault imaginable on the maintenance of a coherent society as well as individual sanity. It feels like madness. Without a shared commitment to truthfulness, there can be no trust among people. And the human bond, which is essential to our survival, unravels and ultimately dissolves. But we don't have to go that far to be profoundly concerned. We have taken for granted our democracy. Latin American nations, and in the recent past, and African nations still, may have their coups, their autocrats, their tyrants, and shaky and corrupt governments which come and go like the wind. But not America. We are the exception. But today, however, we are faced, forced to think that maybe our self-assurance has been misplaced and we are compelled to worry, really worry, if and how American democracy and its freedoms will endure. The decades since the Second World War have left many of us fe with the feeling that we were making a slow but inexorable march towards progress as more and more classes of people who were traditionally excluded from the circle of equality are becoming recognized and included within that widening circle, African Americans, women, gays, people from foreign lands bringing new cultures, the disabled. Progress may have been halting and accompanied by great struggle, but we were making progress nevertheless towards a more pluralistic, more inclusive, more tolerant society. With the emergence of Donald Trump, we are witnessing a resurgence, a legitimation and mainstreaming, mainstreaming of hatred, which we assumed was confined to the extreme margins of society and the possession of a few cranks and crackpots. America has always possessed strong currents of racism and jingoism, but now nationalism and naked racism issue from those powerful office in the land. Now the word Nazi has become normalized in America. Now it is as if the lid has been taken off civilization and civility and a raw, primitive, bestial underside of humanity's darkest propensities and impulses have been unleashed. Suddenly our current condition seems insecure and our future uncertain. It is nothing less than very disturbing and raises the question 
which we have never before been forced to ask. With an unhinged autocrat and demagogue as our president, are our democratic institutions stable and strong enough to withstand and outlast this foul wind which poisons and pollutes American society? The greatest hope, I think, the greatest sign of hope, is that the menace that confronts us has inspired resistance, resistance at all levels and throughout multiple precincts of American society. Resistance, I believe, is the answer. We need to join, talking about us, need to join with others to resist, organize, speak out, and defy and frustrate evil at every turn and assert pressure at every point in the service of preserving freedom and democracy, reason and civility, mutual respect, inclusion, and decency. Which brings me to ethical culture. I truly believe, I truly believe that ethical culture and the humanism that undergirds it embodies the values that stand in direct opposition to the evils that confront us. In embryo, in embryo, we are the answer to forces that threaten American society. Ethical culture answers tyranny with freedom, autocracy with democracy. Where we see bigotry and hatred, ethical culture stands for respect and reverence for the other. Where Trumpism promotes white nationalism, ethical culture stands for social pluralism and the beauty of the human mosaic. Where Trump thrives on scapegoating, ethical culture promotes compassion and human solidarity. Where a reactionary politics fosters a society of economic disparity and privilege, ethical culture holds out an egalitarian vision and a commitment to equality. Where Trump embellishes lies and forsakes the truth, on which, again, all society is ultimately based for the sake of power, ethical culture exalts the search for truth. Where Trump panders to anti-intellectualism and mocks the reality of facts while disparaging evidence, reason, and science, ethical culture upholds these commitments as essential for social survival and commensurate with what is good and civilizing and ennobling in the human experience. Ethical culture has never been a quietist organization. We are activists, and we are called to put our values into action. However tired we may be, these times require that we commit ourselves to the struggle. It's a precept of ethical culture that the future is an open future, and we human beings have some power, some ability, we don't know how much, however, to mold our own future in concert with our aspirations and the values and ideals that we hold. But in these times which call us to engage the political struggle, we need to be able to do two things simultaneously. We need to engage the struggle, I believe, with a sense of militancy. But while we do so, we need to make sure that we hold on to our own values and not become or begin to look like the evils we are combating. We need to hold fast to our humanistic values, both for our own sake as individual women and men and as a foil to the negative and destructive political and social environment that we confront. If what ethical culture stands for and what it does is an answer to the destructive forces which have come so quickly to dominate our political lives, then this address early on provides a good opportunity to probe the question of what more precisely are the values that ethical culture and its underlying philosophy of humanism put forward. This is the mainstay, really, of what I'm talking about this morning, my thesis. All of that was an extended introduction. Next year will mark my 50th year of affiliation with ethical culture and my 49th in a professional capacity. I gotta tell you, friends, it's beginning to feel like a career. <laughs> in, in, almost, in almost half a century, I have never for a moment, however, lost a belief in the importance of what our movement represents and perhaps now more so than ever. But I must admit that my understanding of humanism has evolved. And this address is a sharing of that evolution and an attempt to explain where I've currently arrived. It is one of the wonderful things about ethical culture as a religious movement that my ideas and interpretation need not be yours. In ethical culture, the platform, I believe, is a process, an implicit dialogue in the sense that the speaker presents his or her views and those who are present can take from it what they find compelling and push aside that which they don't and perhaps use what is put forward to reflect and refine their own viewpoints 
and their own opinions. I do the speaking and you do the listening, but my hope is that your listening is not passive listening, but is constitutive of an internal, an internal dynamic process which inspires reflection and thought. I want to talk about humanism. I want to talk about humanism, and I will. Contemporary humanism emerges from, I believe, several streams that have flowed into each other. Its development has been complex, so I will begin with a brief historical survey before I move on. As I see it, modern humanism has three major sources that converged, that came together in the 20th century. The first was the extraordinary revolution brought by the European Enlightenment of the 18th century. The Enlightenment ushered in the end of the Middle Ages and created, created the modern world. The Enlightenment created science and as such began to replace supernatural explanations of the world with secular ones. It attacked religion for not only being superstitious, but in the hands of power-hungry churchmen, a major source of human oppression and misery. The Enlightenment replaced the autocracy and feudalism of the Middle Ages, wherein the power of the state issued from kings and the power of God from above, by democracy, in which the power of the state came from the people below. It discovered and encoded into the law the idea of individual rights and proclaimed that it is the duty of the state to protect those individual rights and foster an environment of freedom. The Enlightenment was a heady and exhilarating time. Its temperament was one of skepticism, secularism, and cosmopolitanism. It extended from Edinburgh to Naples, Paris to Berlin, Boston to Philadelphia. It sought to replace ignorance with knowledge, superstition and illusion with reason, authoritarianism with democracy, degradation with dignity, the childhood of humankind with its maturity, traditional religion with secularism, divine will with natural law. But most of all, the Enlightenment cherished freedom the freedom to inquire, the freedom to know, and freedom from political tyranny. The Enlightenment claimed such geniuses as the Scotsman David Hume and Adam Smith, the Englishman John Locke and Jeremy Bentham, the Germans Gotthold Lessing and Immanuel Kant, the Italian Cesare Beccaria, the Frenchman Montesquieu, Rousseau, and Voltaire, and the Americans Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, among dozens of others. These philosophes, as they were called, preached ethics and free trade, tolerance and universalism, democracy and revolution, human dignity, and a humane punishment for criminals. While most of these figures did not abandon their belief in God, they relegated God to the austere and impersonal role of the grand architect of the universe, as George Washington frequently called him, while they moved to the forefront of their concerns the radical and progressive improvement of human society and employed reason, science, and political freedom as these vehicles to get us there. The most exalted of human faculties the Enlightenment proclaimed was reason, always written with a capital R. Not scripture, not blind faith, but reason should be the governor of our lives. When we talk about the emergence of humanism, perhaps the contribution of the greatest of the Enlightenment philosophers, the German Immanuel Kant, was the most influential. Kant was a very difficult thinker. But he did two things. First, he provided the most powerful defense of human dignity. He proclaimed that when it comes to human beings, morality demands that we not treat the humanity we find in others and in ourselves merely as a means, as a tool to be exploited for somebody's interests, but we regard human beings as, quote, ends in themselves. That is, is reason, reasoning and autonomous free agents to be respected and reverenced as such. A century later, Kant was to find a disciple in Felix Adler, the founder of our ethical culture movement. His central contribution to the emergence of humanism had to do with Kant's theory of knowledge, much more complex. Kant argued that that which we can truly know can be based only on our experience, the experience coming through our five senses. That which is beyond our experience, which transcends our experience, we simply cannot know. And the great transcendental reality, the great transcendental, transcend, transcendent being, of course, is God. Consequently, according to Kant's theory of knowledge, we cannot claim any knowledge about God, even whether he or she exists. We may have faith that he does, but we cannot know with any certainty or conviction that he does. 
What Kant did thereby was open the door to agnosticism, which is a line of thought that emerged and became popular among intellectuals, especially in Victorian England and America in the late 19th century. A second stream, which fed into the formation of humanism, also derives from Kant's theory of knowledge and flourished in the United States before the Civil War. The most significant figure in this regard was the New England sage and essayist, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson started his career as a Unitarian minister. But it should be said that the Unitarianism of his day is not at all what Unitarianism is today. It was then highly doctrinal, Bible-based, certainly God-centered, rigid, priggish, and the possession of high-minded Boston Brahmins who occupied the ruling class of the day. It was, as Emerson came to call it, quote, corpse cold. Not warm and fuzzy, as it's become, <laughs> but corpse cold. It's done 100% inversion, okay, since then. Under the pressures of modern science and influenced by the idealism of Immanuel Kant, Emerson left the Unitarian ministry, abandoned his belief in Christianity, and declared that miracles are monsters. Emerson was a romantic. Among the beliefs of romanticism is that intuition or feelings, as opposed to reason, is like a sixth sense. The feelings, in other words, are an organ of knowledge. And so Emerson revised Kant's thinking rather radically by saying that we could actually know transcendental realities, not through experience or science, but again through feelings and intuitions, which conveyed, he believed, a type of immediacy and certainty. He affirmed that the heart has its reasons that reason knows not, so to speak. If I know that Mary loves me, I know it not because I have done a scientific study of Mary that has brought me to that conclusion, I just know it. I just know it. It's in my heart, and I know it with a type of certainty that evidence could never, scientific or empirical evidence, could never distill. What Emerson created was a belief system that came to be known as transcendentalism. Emerson did not believe in a personal God, but he did believe in the supervening reality of transcendent ideals, such as truth, goodness, justice, beauty, always written again with capital letters. For Emerson, the ideals are austerely impersonal, but highly spiritualized, and they flow through all reality, all of nature, including us. For Emerson, these ideals are equated with the divine, which means that we human beings are also partially divine, which is a profound Christian heresy. As noted for Emerson and his transcendentalists, such as Thoreau, who is sort of the grandfather of modern environmentalism, nature is spiritual which is one reason why they, Emerson and his friends, like to spend a lot of time walking around the woods, okay, with, you know, the Adirondacks or the Berkshires. They spent a lot of time in the woods because they saw the woods, they saw nature flowing through, I mean, a spirit flowing through nature and so on, the sort of divine. Emerson talks a lot about communing with trees and even vegetables which are all manifestations, a little over the top, which are all manifestations of a spiritual divine reality that flows through them. There's a beautiful essay called Nature that he wrote, which I walk through, I walk through the woods and I commune with the vegetable. I, uh, he speaks to the vegetable and the vegetable speaks to him and so on and so forth. It's a communing of spirits or actually one spirit that takes up residence in everything. Us, the vegetables, the tomatoes, the Brussels sprouts, who knows? Okay, everything is sort of spiritualized. It should be said that next to Kant, Emerson was the second greatest influence on Felix Adler, and Adler had actually met what Ralph Waldo Emerson when he, Adler was in his 20s and the sage was in his 70s. But it should also be said that neither Emerson nor Adler were humanists in the way in which we use the term today. In fact, Adler didn't like the term humanism because, it felt, because he felt it asserted a misplaced emphasis on human beings and their welfare first and foremost. It was for him too humanocentric, too humanocentric. Our primary focus in life, he, he believed, rather should be on these transcendental ideals, which he believed, as did Emerson, were more real than the physical and natural world which we know through our experience. That's a position that idealists hold, that triangles have greater reality than, let's say, this lectern. 
you know it seems a little bit preposterous but the argument would be the triangles are eternal they've always been around uh, and they're cha they don't they're, they don't come into existence and fade away they're not born and they don't die they're not transient they're eternal outside of time they are absolute unchanging and so on whereas this lectern comes into existence as we all do at certain a certain point then it'll disappear it's transient and short-lived whereas these ideals you know this goes back to plato whereas these ideals have a type of unchanging reality to them so that's you know emerson, emerson believed that kant believed that uh, plato believed that and felix adler believed that right okay after the civil war and again, under the pressure of science and agnosticism, to which Darwin gave a great boost, certain Unitarians, especially in the Midwest, began to use the term humanism to describe a belief system which replaced the reality of these impersonal ideals with a focus on human beings as thoroughly natural beings and the need to support human interests and the flourishing of human beings. Humanism entered left-wing religious vocabulary. Well, a third major stream in the creation of contemporary humanism was arguably the thought of John Dewey, the great luminary of the Columbia philosophy department and his followers. Dewey stood opposed to philosophical idealism, which had been the leading philosophy of the 19th century, especially in continental Europe. In America, in the 20th century, idealism was replaced with a philosophy of naturalism, which in simplest terms is the belief that nature is all that there is and there is nothing outside of nature. I consider myself to be a philosophical naturalist. Okay. Um, we, of course, recognize ideals, but unlike the beliefs of Kant, Emerson, and Adler, naturalists affirm that ideals grow out of natural processes of our physical brains when they interact with our experiences and ideals therefore have no independent or prior existence of their own like triangles that float around up there. As such, human beings are totally natural beings and by extension the highest purpose in life is to ensure human flourishing. With that assertion, contemporary humanism came into its own. Okay, so those are my three sources. You could look at the history otherwise, but my history, it was the Enlightenment, okay, and the, uh, the reason being put in the forefront. It was especially the, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. It was the romanticism of Emerson, and then the transformation of this idealism into a full-blown humanism uh, under the thought of John Dewey, who was a naturalist, all right? Okay, among certain individuals, among certain intellectuals, humanism thereafter began to take shape around a cluster of beliefs and principles, beliefs and principles. And what emerged was a series of humanist manifestos laying out these principles. So for example, the first, the Humanist Manifesto I, published in 1933 with the input in part of John Dewey, contained 15 briefly stated principles. Emerging from it was an organization, the American Humanist Association, founded in 1941, mostly, again, by left-wing Unitarians. The AHA was founded as a totally secular organization, and it remains so today. In the 1960s, in a written statement, leaders in the ethical culture movement explicitly identified ethical culture as a humanist movement. And as we know, some ethical culture societies changed their names to ethical humanist societies in order to conform to this identification. In recent decades, we have seen a profusion of new rationalist, secularist, and atheist organizations which are part of a growing humanist movement. Whereas the first humanist manifesto was drafted in the name of what was called a religious humanism, the second humanist manifesto, written in 1973, is a wholly secular document and takes a stronger position in opposition to religion and reflects more closely what these new humanist organizations, those today, stand for. Where I'm leading, where I am leading is that whereas humanism defines itself as opposing creeds and dogmas, which it associates with traditional religion and strongly affirms intellectual freedom, it has nevertheless coalesced around a series of identifiable beliefs and principles which define it. That is really a mainstay of my thesis, that humanism is co coalesced into a roster of identifiable beliefs and articulated principles. Among these beliefs is the guiding importance of reason, an abiding belief in science and the scientific method, a commitment to the rules of evidence, 
an appreciation for the individual and political freedom, a commitment to democracy as the best form of government, a pressing need to establish a just world built on fairness and equality for all, a dedication to individualism and individual rights, commitment to knowledge and education, and a respect for the dignity of all people. I think it should also be accurate to say that a major dynamic that drives contemporary humanism is seeing itself in opposition to traditional supernatural religion, which is a product of its Enlightenment heritage with a little dose of Marxism thrown in. You know, religion is the opium of the people sort of argument, okay? A little bit thrown in. Whereas religion is benighted, superstitious, irrational, unprovable, and divides people from each other, is oppressive and provides justification for violence and a whole raft of other evils, humanism, in addition to being secular, is rational, liberating, respectful of the autonomy of the person, plays a premium on human welfare, fulfillment, and happiness, and is essentially progressive. For humanism, religion is the foil the boogeyman against which it primarily defines itself. I'm trying to talk about which shapes, I don't know if this, this is clear, I've given you a lot of stuff, uh, but it, it, I'm trying to give you the, the substance out of which modern humanism sort of congealed and, and basically forms itself, finds itself, all right? And a lot of it has to do with being anti-religion. You know, religion is the bad guy, the boogeyman, and we're sort of, we're, religion is superstitious, we're enlightened, you know, I mean, we're, the repository of all good things, you know, is religion, it's a bad thing. All right, my point again is that humanism, as it has evolved into a movement, has centered itself around this particular cluster of principles and beliefs. The fact that humanism so defines itself around a series of beliefs is unavoidable and inevitable. After all, we all define ourselves individually and certainly communicate who we are to others by articulating what it is we believe, what our opinions are, and so on. In great measure, we identify ourselves with what we believe, and even more so to movements of whatever kind. That's unavoidable. But it is at this point, and here I'm bringing this long you know, essay to a close, but at this point, I become personal and admit that my appreciation and understanding of humanism has changed. I, f I need to be very, very clear, however. Throughout my career as a professional humanist, I've affirmed these beliefs, which I've just mentioned, and principles, have centered my life around them, and I continue to do so. However essential such beliefs are, I have come nevertheless to the viewpoint that identifying humanism around beliefs alone does not embrace the deeper meaning of what humanism is or what it means to be a humanist. Beliefs, in my view, do not necessarily a humanist make. In other words, humanism is not solely a system of belief or principles that a person holds. I have come to see humanism rather as what we might call a disposition, an orientation, a sensibility, an expression of character which reaches more deeply than merely a roster of beliefs and principles. This is really, it's subtle, it's hard to get at and grasp, but this is really the centerpiece of what I'm trying to con convey and share with you. Humanism is sometimes criticized as being overly intellectual at the expense of feelings and to a certain extent, I think that this is true. As human beings, we are far more than the beliefs we hold. We are creatures of feelings, drives, proclivities, and our complex inner lives. We are creatures of contradictions and irrational longings and wishes. We experience joy and tragedy and much more that makes us human. It was the ancient Roman playwright Terence who had once said, I am a human being, therefore nothing human is alien from me. It is this wider sensibility that I am grasping at, that I'm aiming for. I want a humanism that is broad and deep enough to appreciate the farther reaches of human experience. The humanism I am aiming for is manifest in people who possess what we might call a sensitivity or a feeling for humanity, for the human dimension that expresses itself in art and music, for example, in human expressions of joy and tragedy, in all their subtlety and nuance, and most of all, in human character, in human character. People who are artistically trained can see this human dimension in certain great works of art, or hear the human cry in certain strains of music, and certainly in novels, poetry, and drama. We may not be able to clearly define this element, but with a touch of the romantic, perhaps, 
we perceive an indwelling dignity in the struggles of women and men, in our fellow human beings who are fated to assert their finite and limited capacities against a reality which is always greater than we are. And we can see this element in other human beings who have an abiding empathy for the pain of others, who are moved by compassion and are people of deep-rooted moral substance. You know, I have some conversance with the Yiddish language. And the most beautiful thing you can say about a human being, male or female, is that he or she is a mensch. Okay, and that's what I'm heading. I'm heading towards menschlichkeit. All right, that is really the centerpiece of my address, that they're a person of deep and abiding moral substance and character. That's what I'm looking at. This feeling, this sensitivity, is not something that can be reduced to a principle or neatly communicated in a belief. It expresses, it, it exists and expresses itself at a deeper level of human experience. It is a sensitivity of the unique dimension, the unique human dimension of the human condition. Humanism, as earlier described, is most comfortable in what I have sometimes referred to as the harder values, the values of justice, equality, fairness. These hard values are objective values that in some sense can be measured. The humanism I am speaking of now appreciates what we might call the softer values, values such as compassion, kindness, empathy, values that are harder to objectify, but in my view of no less importance. Some tough-minded humanists may sneeringly dismiss, dismiss the importance of being nice to others, seeing niceness as nothing more than mere sentimentality. Being right and being principled, they might argue, is far more important. But I would contend that being a nice person and being kind and sensitive to the feelings of others is of the greatest value. We would have a far, far better world if people were simply nicer and kinder to one another. <laughs> Considering humanism in this wider sense, religion for me is not necessarily the foil, is not the boogeyman. No doubt much of religion is stupid, embarrassingly anti-intellectual, oppressive, divisive, and cruel. But I have no doubt if religion were to disappear tomorrow, it would not take more than a nanosecond for certain people to cling to other ideologies, be it nationalism, tribalism, or simply the lust for sheer power as a rationale to oppress, maim, and kill their fellow human beings. Okay? Religion is not the source of all evil. And that's a mistake, I think, that humanism is too preoccupied with re setting up religion as the bad guy. On the other hand, I have to admit, out of my personal experience, as I grow older and I appreciate this ever more, I have some very, very good friends who are traditionally and indeed conservatively religious, who nevertheless are exceedingly compassionate and sensitive human beings, sensitive to the humanity of others, not merely their own, but to people more broadly. And being such, I conclude there is a great deal of humanism in these friends and people like them. To my mind, character counts far more than formal belief. What matters to me more is how people are, again, and not solely the ideas they subscribe to or hold. And so I end my talk as I began. We are in, a ve we are in very difficult times. We are going to need to stiffen our spines and use whatever resources we have to do battle with the political and social challenges that threaten us. I believe that there is real evil in the world and we can't pretend otherwise. We need to confront these forces that threaten our democracy and freedom. But as we do so, let us not permit the enemy to define us. Let us plan, organize, and struggle as we must. But at the same time, let us not lose sight of what at the farthest reaches matters most. As we are just, let us also be kind. As we are tough, let us also be compassionate. As we are principled, let us be forgiving. As we are strong, let us also be sensitive. And as we are righteous in our cause, let us also be humble.